Our speaker tonight and tire is Donovan Clary, here with the son Cooper. Uh, Donovan came down from, uh, from Illinois, from Oklahoma, the Illinois River. So please welcome him. Hi, thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. I see a couple of familiar faces. So anyway, uh, carp fishing is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, something that I've been passionate about for a lot of years, and to be honest, I just really feel like I got proficient catching them, uh, I don't know, two or three years ago. Struggled with them. I mean, I knew they were there. I would see them, but getting them to eat a fly, getting a fly in front of them without spooking them was the hardest struggle, and then figuring out what they wanted to eat was the second struggle. Once I figured that out, uh, I don't want to say I've gotten good at it, but I've gotten a lot better. And I guess I can catch them most of the time. Uh, and tonight in the presentation, uh, I don't know if you guys picked up on that. I ran off and left my thumb drive at home. I spent about six hours yesterday updating my presentation. The only one that I have is on my cell phone, and it is my old presentation. So talk to Finney, and my plans are, and I'll announce this again later, uh, I'll run off of my old presentation, take as many questions as you guys want to throw at me, and then I will send the club my new presentation, and you guys can post it on the Internet and then get in touch with me if you've got any questions. Uh, the biggest thing that I have found uh, with carp is basically a lot of like trout fishing. You know, you can take any fly that's designed for carp and you can go out and you can have two fish day, three fish day if you're lucky, maybe one fish, sometimes no fish. And what I struggled with uh, was matching the hatch. I mean, I could see the fish feeding. I knew they were eating on something, but they wouldn't take my fly. They would come over and look at it Sometimes they would take it, most of the time they wouldn't. So I approached it totally different. I took my saying that I used trout fishing and literally started trudging through the mud and scooping up everything that I could find in the water and started trying to figure out exactly what the fish were feeding on. Went so far as to take my little sample bottles that I tied trout flies with and started dropping leeches and crustaceans, everything that I found in these ponds. And what I come up with and what I realized is every body of water is a little bit different. And when you find a carp that is feeding, if you put something in front of him that is a close resemblance of what he's used to seeing, it's, he's going to eat it if you don't spook him. But if you throw something out of left field out there that he's never seen, they're not, most of the time they're not going to eat it. Uh, sometimes they will, most of the times they won't. Uh, the biggest or the best pattern that I have found that is most universal is dragonflies, dragonfly nymphs. They're everywhere. Dirty water, clean water, cold water, warm water, moving water, still water, dragonfly nymphs are everywhere. So doing the research, dragonfly nymphs, they live four years in the water. And they molt four to 17 times. So they're basically microscopic to the size of your thumbnail. So there's a lot of different stages. And if you can identify dragonflies in the water anywhere, dragonfly nymphs, that's what I would go with. Second would be a damselfly. Those two. This is what I found literally from Texas in the hill country all the way to Indianapolis. Uh, so that's what I'm going to show you today. And this is just a general, um, basically a dragonfly nymph pattern. You catch uh, bass. Too. Yep. Ba anything in the water will eat these things. They're very, very popular. Um, the thing that I like about the patterns is, and you guys will have to connect me or correct me with the uh, camera here is you can tie them in several different colors and in my presentation we'll get into like uv spectrum and color choices and, and sizes but um, so basically the the pattern is going to be marabou tail uh, some kind of dubbing sometimes i'll use marabou for the body uh, tapered body um, using, using bead chain eyes uh, all four sizes small medium large or extra small small medium and large uh, basically to the hook size. I'll tie this from basically a uh, size 12 scud hook, just like you would tie an egg pattern on for, for a trout. Um, size 12 all the way down to like a size six. Uh, tonight we got size six hooks. This is a TMZ 2457, uh, super, super popular hook. And, uh, and they're, they're pretty strong, they'll hold up. Eyes, uh, eyes on this one is large. Uh, just B chain eyes. Uh, I prefer black. Silver will work. Uh, any of the other colors that you have, you know, as long as 
uh, they're to scale. Uh, you don't want a really, really small hook and great big eyes. Uh, Cohen's carp dub uh, is one of the body materials. Uh, basic ice dub. Uh, notice that's UV, and again, we'll talk about that later. And then uh, some, some rubber legs. Uh, span flex works, you can tie a lot, uh, and you have span flex, don't feel like you gotta run out and buy something different. Lights on the fritz here. All right, if I cover up the camera, you guys correct me. So the bead chain eyes, uh, I'm sure most of you guys are probably experienced tires. Something that I struggle with. I've uh, been doing this off and on since the early 90s, and uh, I still learn stuff. But crowding the eye. So this pattern is basically going to stand on its head using the eye of the hook and then the bead chain. It's going to stand vertical. So what you have to do is keep the eyes close to the eye, uh, excuse me, keep the beads close to the eye, but you also need to leave enough room in front of the beads to finish uh, when you get done so that it doesn't look crowded. Figure eight. Normally I'll put um, water soluble uh, or water based glue. Uh, but carp are very, very sensitive to smell, so uh, no super glue, nothing that's, you know, quick drying or uh, UV would probably work because I don't think you're going to get any smell off of UV, but you definitely don't want to use uh, any kind of super glue. This is just strung marabou, and I'm using it in black. No, the, the, the deal with the carp, they're very, very in tune with splashes. I mean, their lateral line is huge compared to other fish. I mean, it's literally their entire side. So they, I mean, they know, they'll hear you walking, they'll sense you walking, I mean, on the bank. Yeah, I mean, rod length off of the water. Um, we've done it, we started doing like a video series, we're gonna post it up on YouTube eventually, but we've been doing, you know, study and just, you know, a, a guy stationary, videoing on a, a carp that is, you know, head down feeding, there's no doubt that fish is not worried about anything in this world. I'm mic'd up and I'll walk up there close to him and I'll sneak up, you know, using cover, uh, grass, trees, whatever's around me, and I can get right up on that fish. And then I'll walk past him, turn around, all right guys, here I come, and I'll just walk at a, a normal speed and be coming from behind the fish and the fish will spook, Some sometimes as far as 40 or 50 feet. So, uh, you want your fly to be as light as possible for the entry, um, but you're also going to have to get it down deep. So, um, you know, one of the ways that I like, or one of the places I like to fish, is uh, up at Texoma around some of the boat docks. There's huge carp there, and, and they're eating crawdads, they're eating Harris mud crabs. I mean, they're easy to catch, but they're deep. Yeah, <laughs> French fries, bread, <laughs> lettuce, whatever you can find around a restaurant. Yeah, but you have to get your fly deep to them. So the flies that I tie to use there, I won't be throwing in knee deep water at a pond. Uh, tail, basically the same length as the shank of your hook. You want it to stick up, but you don't want it to be uh, overpowering or you know, a lot larger than uh, the body of the fly. Some guys will palmer this all the way to the front. I don't like the bulk. Um, if I want to taper the body, I'm going to use the dubbing to do it myself so that I got a little more control. So this one we're just going to use the ice dub. As far as colors go, uh, blacks, olives, browns. Those are the three. I mean, uh, I brought a couple of my better boxes to let you guys look at. Uh, I've got a couple of rust browns, uh, some dark browns. But used to, I would have reds, I would have five or six different shades of brown, and uh, what I have... Is your thread wax? Uh, no, no, that's uh, you need thread six on. But what I found is olive, black, brown, that's the only three colors that I really need. So I would rather have a couple of different sizes of each color versus too many different colors.
I'm coming up behind the eyes. Hopefully you can see this. I'm double wrapping just to build up a little bit of bulk. I'm going to come over the eyes to capture it. And then right behind it, just, just a few wraps. Uh, I find myself using way too many wraps and way too many knots just because I'm not putting any glue on here. With the legs, I've got two strands. They're not separated. I'm basically just going to lay them behind the bead chain. A couple of wraps each direction, figure eight. Two over the top. This is normally where I have the, the most trouble. I'll bulk up too fast. The good thing about this dubbing is if you mess it up, you can take it right off and start all over sometimes. Wrapping in front of the legs, and I'm going to let the dubbing kind of push the legs rearward. it out. Super simple and fast and you don't, uh, you don't get upset if you break it off in a big fish. This is going to do is going to give it kind of a kick stand so that it will stand on its head a little better than the rubber legs. There's times when water's muddy, uh, one of the blind spots on carp, they're one of the only fish to have uh, almost 360 degrees of visibility, but they do have a blind spot right off of the tip of their nose under their mouth where they can't see. So once they get that close to whatever it is they're trying to eat or thinking about eating, they're relying on their sense of touch and their sense of smell. And their mouths are very, very sensitive. So a lot of times, if you've got a fly down there that's, that's laying, you know, horizontal in the mud, they'll skim right over the top of it. They don't ever touch it. Uh, so if they don't actually see your fly come in, you know, they have to encounter it when they swim over the top. You want something sticking up that they're going to bump into, swim over, think that it may be food. And I'll show you in a couple of my boxes, I've got some that have really, really long tails. But basically, a rooster hackle and just a couple of wraps right behind the head or the eyes. I lost it. Again, all this hackle is doing is giving it something to brace itself on.
Push your hackle back, give it a couple of wraps so that your dubbing can So these are on the large scale. These would be probably that third or fourth year nymph, where if, if I was fishing it and I wasn't getting any takes, but I was getting some interest, I would probably drop down a size or two, uh, maybe try to imitate something a little bit younger. But each time those nymphs uh, molt, uh, you know, they're they're going to be losing their exoskeleton and, and emerging a little bit larger. So can you see, hopefully, there we go. So you see how the hackle is basically just acting as a kickstand to help support the body of the hook and get it to stand more vertical. They come out of the water. Uh, you know that's a good question. I really don't know. They stay in the mud. Did they? Okay. Yeah. Because they would dehydrate if they came out of their water. Yeah, but they don't. Well, they had, obviously they got to go back in. <laughs> that fly seems to be universal to me. I would think in a 14 or 16, it'd be a great trouble. Oh, it should be, especially if you're, you know, somewhere where you're seeing a bunch of. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the dragonfly nymphs that I pump, I mean, most of the time you can't really even pump them. I, mean, I don't know what size this tubing is, but, you know, once I get this thing down and, you know, I, I let the bulb, most of the time it'll, it, it, it'll, yeah, exactly, something's jammed up. Oh, man, I got something good. You pull it out, and sure enough, it would be, you know, mostly dragonfly, you know, halfway down. A lot of times moss or, you know, remnants of cigarette butts or... Um, you know, cottonwood seeds. They eat a lot of cottonwood seeds, and you know, in the spring. But uh, most of the time, I mean, uh, there's one fly. I think I brought it. So I'll share this with you guys. So Texoma. Uh, so Texas, Colorado, Illinois. Those are the two or the three uh, states that are cutting edge as far as carp fly fishing tournaments go. Uh, they're really big in Europe, especially Western Europe, but we're play, kind of playing catch up here in the States. So, so uh, there, there's one every year. The finals is coming up in Fort Worth in two weeks, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, it's called the Carpers United and starts in, in Houston, goes to San Antonio, Austin area, and then they have the finals in Fort Worth every year. Fly fishing, Jordan. yeah. Fly fishing for carp. Okay. Yeah, check into it. It's a ton of fun. There's some guys that are over the top carp fly fishermen. So uh, the the rules of the tournament is you have to fish within 100 miles of the host. So I didn't know anywhere in Houston to go, and I wasn't going to drive 10 hours to go down there and try to catch carp someplace that I'd never been. Same thing with San Antonio. But when I got to Fort Worth, I'm like, man, I think Texoma is you know in the in the boundary and all of Texoma with the exception of the far northeast corner was I could fish Eisenhower I could fish High Point I could fish all the way to the dam but it was that basically that one arm far northeast that uh, I never went there anyway most of the stuff I was fishing was Red River area you know inflows creeks and stuff so anyway I started pre-fishing down there and uh, Harris mud crabs anybody know about Harris mud crabs so there is two lakes in the United States that freshwater crabs live, and they're both in Texas. Texoma, Possum Kingdom. And Department of Wildlife doesn't even know how they got here, where they came from. They had to come up the Red River. I mean, that's the only, you know, the only big way for them to get, you know, from the Gulf. Anyway, Harris mud crabs. You can Google it. You can look it up. It's basically a small crab pattern. Looks just like what you would find in the ocean, but... They're dark brown, and they live in, in muddy water, dirty, brackish water. Uh, so Texoma is loaded with them like epidemic. Uh, they're taking over 
Uh, it's got a lot to do with the guides cleaning their fish and dumping the carcasses in the water. So uh, when I heard about this carp tournament uh, coming to Fort Worth and I wanted to fish in it and uh, I needed to be able to fish in Texoma. Uh, so what I did, go to Texoma, start, start pre-fishing. This is before I knew anything about Harris mud crabs. But uh, anyway, was there fishing with crawdad patterns. And my whole idea was, man, they gotta be dumping. I've seen them dump fish carcasses. You know, I've been all over trout streams in Missouri that are basically, you know, trout farms. You know, everybody keeps their fish. They'll clean their fish right there in the water. You walk up, there's a dozen crawdads on every one of them. So I'm like, man, carp eat crawdads. The guy that crawdads gotta be down there underneath those uh, guide slips eating the dead fish. So that's how I approached it. And the more research and the more time that I spent, I realized, man, they're eating more Harris mud crabs than they are crawdads. So I came up with this Harris mud crab. Uh, it's got UV glue on the bottom uh, with a small lead dumbbell eye that I've got figure eighted on the middle of the shank. But you could take this right now. I would buy you dinner if you went to Texoma and you didn't catch carp before dark. Um, the trouble that you're going to find fishing with these that way is you're going to be fishing in deep water, mostly 8 to 10 feet. You're not going to see the fish. So it's a lot of blind casting. You're going to cast it as far as you can, as close as you can to cover, where you think those fish parts are going to be, and you're going to slowly drag it across the bottom, just like you were you know, swinging a streamer or something. And you're going to wait till you feel the take, and you set the hook, and it may be 3 pounds, it may be 30 pounds. Are you fishing so, sinking line? Uh, in the deeper water, yes. Um, I, I would say probably as a generalization, anything over like three foot deep, you're going to need a sinking line. And not so much uh, for, your, for your presentation, but more for detecting the strikes. Uh, so, you know, the same, the same tournament uh, where the Harris mud crabs came into play, we were catching fish around some of the boat docks in deeper water. Uh, I would say 10 to 20 feet of water. They were just cruising fish. And we could see them coming past. So, you know, where, where I fish in Oklahoma, a lot of times in the spring, we have muddy water, dirty water. So we're fishing with indicators or we're fishing dry flies as indicators. Because a lot of times you're just casting into a mud cloud. You know that the fish is there, but you have no idea, you know, in relation to the mud cloud as to where his face is pointing. So you basically cast it right in the middle. And again, if you have deep, deep water and you're fishing sinking or floating line, you have that, you know, that, that break in the connection between your rod and you'll get a take. And if you don't notice it, you know, be it your line twitch or indicator or something like that, you know, most of the time you're not going to feel it. Uh, but if you're fishing in water that's, you know, basically half of whatever your leader length is, so, you know, nine foot leader, if you're fishing four foot or deeper, you're not going to feel the take. But if you're fishing shallower, most of the time you'll detect the take you know, on your rod. But a lot of times with these carp, uh, you know, and I, I expect everybody in here is trout fished, you know, most of the time, or a lot of times, trout will take your fly, and you're only gonna, you're gonna detect the strike when he spits your fly out. Carp are the same way, even more so. I, I believe they are more in touch with what's in their mouth than any other fish that you're gonna find. I mean, they, they, they literally suck stuff up and spit it out in a blink, so. Harris mud crabs, um, that's a, a small piece of an ain't breathing material to tie one, but that is a small Velcro pad uh, for the back, uh, some, some ultra chenille, a little bit of marabou. Uh, the eyes are off of a hairbrush that I bought from the Dollar Tree. And you got like a year supply worth of eyes for a buck. And some UV glue, and that's it. And I mean, you can Google it. Not an exact replication, but it is awful close. You said you had a dumbbell eye. And yeah, it. I've got a, a lead dumbbell eye tied into the middle of the hook shank and then just coat it with the UV glue so that it, 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 it is hidden. Um, I'm going to show you guys a couple of. Oh. Well, another thing at Texoma that I got into uh, Stephen Palmer. So, so, how did you do? I won it, I dominated him. So the way that it works, so I, I am the reigning first king of Texas of the carp fly fisher. And it, it pissed a bunch of guys off, which we still <laughs> remain friends. But why? Because what you were fishing. 
It's because they had an aggregate score from all of the series. Every every inch you caught carried over. So catch 200 inches at the first one, 200 inches at the second one, you got 400 inches. Well, the guy that was leading going into the finals had 600 and something inches of carp, and he wasn't coming to Fort Worth. But even if he did, I mean, I'd been pre-fishing it a lot. I knew that I could catch 30-inch average, and I was going to catch 15 to 20 of those fish at 30 inches. No problem. But what I was worried about is how many this guy was going to be able to catch. But he was coming from, you know, he was coming from a new area. He was going to be, you know, depending on somebody local helping him out because he couldn't run back down there and fish his home water. So I felt like I had the advantage, and I knew that I could. I mean, if he didn't have a 200-inch day. I, I felt like I was going to beat him. And he didn't have a 200-inch day except at San Antonio. Or, excuse me, at Houston. He didn't at San Antonio. Anyway, uh, I wanted to break 1,000 inches. I think I caught 996 inches in 10 hours. And I lost the hunt. I, I would have had 1,000 inches. But literally, it was like I got five minutes. Boom! Pop. So I didn't have time to tie on. I was at Texoma. I believe I was at Buncombe Creek. And I had to drive to downtown Fort Worth in two hours uh, to check in and be there, you know, before six o'clock. So I, I didn't want to mess around. Uh, now, the week prior to that tournament, uh, Plano Orvis, um, they held one called Carpnado, yeah. and it was Saturday morning until Sunday afternoon. You could fish 24 hours. So uh, Stephen Palmer, I think, is his name. Yeah. Some of you guys probably know him. Hadn't known him. I mean, we'd been friends on Facebook, talking back and forth. I was asking him about this tournament, and uh, I call him. I'm like, hey, man, can I just give you a call? i got a bunch of questions. So I call him. I'm like, what about fishing oh, at night? And he's like, how are you going to catch carp at night? And I was like, I, I can. I do. Is it legal? I mean, is it from daylight till dark Saturday and Sunday or daylight till cutoff or 24 hours? He's like, man, you fish all night long if you want. So several years ago, Texoma. I uh, was down there just spending the day trying to catch striper, actually. And uh, anyway, dark comes around. We're standing around one of the boathouses, and you could hear June bucks flying around, all of the lights, the security lights, and you would hear them into the metal siding, and then poop, then they, were, they would literally be, you know, flailing around, stuck in the water. Carp would come up and eat it. So as soon as I saw that, I'm like, beetles, brown beetles. <laughs> so this is my June bug pattern. And the trick to this is a heavy gauge hook, and you want to bounce it, it you first. want to hit the wall. <laughs> so it's gotten to the point that I, I will pick up pea gravel and start bouncing it off of the tin, and then here they come. And then you're just sight fishing for them. And any kind of brown beetle, uh, anything that's going to imitate, you know, some kind of beetle, June bug, potato bug, whatever you want to call it, on the water, that will eat it. And I ended up winning that tournament, and my son ended up in second place and almost beat me. And that pissed a lot of guys off the first week. They were really mad the second week. But so I go back, and Steve's like, I can't believe it. I'm like, try it. it try it. So I'm not going to make it this year. And, and I, I mean, I haven't got any email invitations like, hey, man, you're going to make it this year? So anyway, I mean, I don't have any kind of hard feelings with those guys, and I'm, I'm I'm very humble about it, but I, I took it serious. I took it a lot more serious than, than some, of, uh, some of those other guys. Um, another pattern that I really like, damselflies. A lot like what you saw, just a little bit smaller, uh, a little bit longer body, not quite as much bulk. Um, this is marabou wrap, front to back, with a wire rib. How many other species do you catch using that pattern? 